than never, our health means everything. And when the need arises, the best healthcare facilities are closer than you think. A smooth medical journey from the Philippines to Singapore is now within reach. At the Patient Assistance Center, operated by Parkway Hospitals Singapore, patients are provided with fuss-free access to quality health care. Located at the ground floor of Marco Polo Hotel in Ortigas Center, Pasig City, the Patient Assistance Center serves Filipino patients and their families who need support in medical and travel arrangements. The center connects Filipino patients to the world-class medical care and offshore medical treatment of Mount Elizabeth Hospital. Mount Elizabeth Hospital has been serving the Asia-Pacific for over 40 years as a medical hub in the Asia-Pacific region. Its strategic pairing of medical talents with revolutionary medical technology paved the way for its Joint Commission International Accreditation, the gold seal of approval for quality health care. The one-stop shop concierge offers services such as medical referrals and appointment booking, evacuation and repatriation assistance, flight reservation, visa application and extension, accommodation arrangement, airport meet and greet service and domestic transfer arrangement, direct admission arrangement assistance before, during and after hospitalization, multi-language translation and interpreter service, hospital billing and financial inquiries. Singapore is a country that has a reputation for excellence. And this includes excellence in healthcare. Hospitals and medical centers there are globally esteemed for the exemplary service and modern facilities. Among them, Parkway Hospital Singapore is a group of four premium hospitals and they provide world-class, top-notch medical experience. In some cases, patients need to get a second or third opinion, as well as medical support from hospitals abroad. Philippine patients can now access the services, experience, and the medical expertise of Parkway Hospital Singapore through the Parkway Patient Assistance Center, or what we call PPAC, which is located and operated in the Philippines. All our staff, with a trademark form of the Filipino, are well-trained and dedicated to attend to the needs of our Philippine patients who are seeking treatment in Singapore. And we seek to provide a journey for every patient that is comfortable and stress-free, as we are fully aware of the difficulties and challenges that the patient and their families are already going through. Philippine patients can now experience the unparalleled medical service that Parkway Hospital Singapore has to offer. For the longest time, I wanted to get an appointment to Mount Elizabeth Hospital in Singapore, but I was uncertain who would be the best specialist for my needs. I am glad I discovered the concert services of Parkway Hospital's Patient Assistance Center to provide the necessary support I need in my travel and medical arrangements. So, I went to their office in Ortigas to inquire about diagnosis and treatment options. They then scheduled a telehealth consult, an online and instant connection from here to medical experts based in Singapore. I was referred to a specialist and they even gave me the details of the number of similar cases handled by that doctor. Everything was made hassle-free, from booking my flights airport transfers, hospital admissions, and even after discharge. I didn't expect this medical journey to be comfortable and stress-free. If you don't want to stress over the process of acquiring a healthcare service in another country, give the Patient Assistance Center a call and let them do the rest for you. The caliber of their service is truly best in class. At Parkway Hospital Singapore Patient Assistance Center Philippines, our services are not just about making bookings, nor just mere transactions. Our efforts are about opening the door for new healthcare possibilities. 
It is about your being able to immediately access several doctor specialists from Parkway Hospital, Singapore for a much needed second opinion. It is about having an excellent option should you or your family member decide to have an overseas medical procedure. And it is about being able to utilize advanced medical technologies that are already available at Parkway Hospital, Singapore. Choosing the best healthcare really matters. Our team at Parkway Philippines is committed to serve. We look forward to the beginning of a fruitful health-centered partnership. Whatever your health concern may be, we are here to help you improve the quality of your life. Access the wide spectrum of medical services of Mount Elizabeth Hospital, Singapore through the Patient Assistance Center. We are here for you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Business World Insights. Today's topic, understanding the matters of the human heart. In this session, presented in partnership with Mount Elizabeth Hospital Singapore, we'll be exploring the latest developments in managing and even preventing cardiovascular disease. My name is Tiago Renais. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Health Tech Venture Builder Day3 Op Innovations, as well as data analytics firm Fort Health Data Systems. And I'll be your moderator today. Whether it's unhealthy diets or smoking habits, various factors lead to the degradation of our hearts and our blood vessels, ultimately leading to the development of cardiovascular diseases. Now, according to the World Health Organization, an estimated 17.9 million people died due to cardiovascular diseases in 2019. That constituted 32% of global deaths that year. The disease remains to be the leading cause of deaths worldwide. But with the latest advances in health science and medical technologies, cardiovascular diseases are now much more manageable. And that's exactly what we'll be discussing today with our three expert cardiologists who I'll be introducing in just a moment. A quick reminder that we'll be selecting audience questions for our Q&A today, so be sure to jot down those questions as we hear from our panelists. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our three speakers leading today's discussion on understanding the matters of the human heart. Our first speaker is Dr. Chan Wan Xian. Dr. Chan is a senior consultant, cardiologist, echocardiologist, and heart failure intensivist at Mount Elizabeth Hospital. In 2001, Dr. Chan graduated with a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery degree from the National University of Singapore and was admitted in 2006 as a member of the UK's Royal College of Physicians. She also completed various trainings in cardiology, cardiography, and women's heart health for, from several institutions in Singapore, Canada, and the United States. Dr. Chan was formerly the senior consultant and co-director of the Women's Heart Health Service at National University Heart Center Singapore and is currently an adjunct assistant professor of the Department of Medicine at the National University of Singapore's Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. Dr. Chan, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, hi everyone. Thanks for inviting. So we'll be hearing from Dr. Chan in a bit. Also joining us today is Dr. Stanley Chia. Dr. Chia is a senior consultant cardiologist and interventional cardiologist at Mount Elizabeth Hospital. Experienced in managing complex coronary artery disease and a variety of other cardiovascular diseases and conditions. Dr. Chia also handles difficult coronary interventional procedures such as left main disease, calcified lesions, and chronic total occlusions, which we'll be talking a bit about later. Dr. Chia was awarded the British Heart Foundation Scholarship Scheme and Junior Research Fellowship to undertake cardiovascular medicine research in a doctoral program that he undertook at the University of Edinburgh from 2000 to 2002. He completed, his, he completed his cardiology advanced specialty training at National Heart Center Singapore and has been certified as a specialist in cardiology since 2006. Dr. Chia, thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. It's truly a pleasure to be here today. And rounding out today's panel is Dr. Edgar Tay. Dr. Tay is a senior consultant cardiologist and interventional cardiologist at Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital. Dr. Tay graduated with a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery degree from the National University of Singapore and was admitted as a member of the UK's Royal College of Physicians. 
He completed advanced training from the National University Heart Center Singapore, the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, and St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. Dr. Tay was formerly a senior consultant and the director of the Structural Heart Disease Program at the National University Heart Center Singapore, where he started the Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implantation Program, the Mitroclip Mitral Valve Repair Program, the Percutaneous Pulmonary Valve Implantation Program, and the Balloon Pulmonary Angioplasty Program for Chronic Thromboembolic Pulmonary Hypertension. Dr. Tay, welcome to the session. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Now, if we can have all our speakers on screen with me, I'll be directing questions to specific panelists. But if you have a quick comment or addition you'd like to add any of the doctors here, uh, please feel free to chime in. So I'd like to kick off today's conversation with a question for Dr. Tay. Uh, Dr. Tay, what basics should the public understand about heart diseases and complications? What kind of lifestyles contribute to one's susceptibility to cardiovascular disease? So that's a great question. Um, as you know, um, you've just mentioned about the high burden of uh, cardiovascular disease in, in the world. And uh, if you look at this slide, 1990 and 2019, uh, several decades apart, and you can still see that the typical lifestyle uh, uh, challenges that we have can account for a lot of the problems that we have. So things like hypertension, high cholesterol, poor diets, smoking, um, all of these remain the challenges that we face until today. We have very good medications, um, but certainly we still have to work on patients' um, uh, ability to kind of understand the medications they're on, as well as to be participative in uh, health style, uh, lifestyle related uh, improvements. And it's also important to know that even up to today, even though we have very uh, excellent medications and technology, a significant proportion of patients still suffer from coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease, as you can see from the chart on the right. About 50% of them have uh, coronary artery blockages. But there are more uh, uh, diseases they're aware of now. So it includes uh, things like uh, structural heart disease, valve disease, atrial fibrillation, uh, or other kinds of arrhythmias. So we're getting better at identifying patients and offering them treatment. Dr. Tay, just a quick follow-up, uh, if you don't mind. How has COVID-19 and vaccinations uh, influenced the cardiovascular field? Yes, that's a very hot topic as uh, most of us are right in the middle of the pandemic uh, now. And you can see from this slide um, that patients with uh, cardiovascular disease are actually at a disadvantage. So if you see this uh, five people all in green, presumably all infected with uh, COVID-19, if the patients have uh, heart disease, they have a four times higher chance of falling off the cliff. Uh, so it's very important that these patients are identified early and continued or treated well because if we have uh, cardiovascular disease, treating them well may actually improve their prognosis, uh, especially in this pandemic. Um, there are also some uh, interesting issues about uh, vaccines. As you know, vaccines are very effective in pre preventing hospitalization and severe illnesses. And there are some concerns, obviously, of things like myocarditis, but these can be, these are generally rare and they can be picked up easily on clinical examination and, ex uh, and on testing. And we can manage these uh, side effects as well. But the rule is take your vaccines and it will protect you. So this slide actually um, uh, actually shows what happens. Uh, a lot of people ask us about vaccine complications, uh, uh, which uh, inflammation of the heart, like myocarditis or inflammation of the lining of the heart called pericarditis. Uh, these uh, can happen. It's about 2.5 per million shots uh, 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 for patients developing these kind of uh, complications but they can be detected easily and they can be managed as well. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, so Dr. Stanichi, I just want to throw this uh, in your direction. Um, what are the most important symptoms we should be watching out for when talking about cardiovascular diseases? Uh, what should we do when we experience these symptoms? Right. So, now, certainly, cardiovascular disease is a very broad spectrum. I think by far, the most common cardiovascular disease is still down to coronary artery disease. And the most typical symptoms of coronary artery disease is what we call as stable angina. In other words, patients may feel 
chest discomfort. Usually we describe this as chest tightness, a constricting heavy sensation, more so in the chest that may radiate down the arm and perhaps even up the neck. And this is typically precipitated by exertion, such as doing housework, climbing stairs, running, going up hills. And again, they may last for several minutes and very typically it will be relieved and resolved by rest or the use of certain medication called glycerol trinitrate. Now, of course, there are also other symptoms. Some of the less typical symptoms, even of coronary artery disease, will be shortness of breath. And actually, in some patients, shortness of breath is the one and only symptoms that they present with. Now, in other words, they just feel a drowning sensation or just a, a, a difficulty in getting enough air in. Some patients may feel that their effort tolerance, uh, or in other words, their endurance has reduced. Some patients may get fainting spells, dizziness, or even confusion. And of course, if they have irregular heart rhythms, they may have a sense of palpitations, like your heart beating very quickly, slowly, irregular, or missing a beat. And for patients with heart failure, there may be fluid retention leading to swelling in the ankles or their lower limbs. Now, of course, for symptom, when patients come with these symptoms, they have to t ask themselves, is this urgent? Certainly, it's a very severe discomfort, chest tightness or shortness of breath that simply wouldn't go away. Then, of course, they should go to the local hospital as soon as possible. But otherwise, if the patients feel that the symptoms get better or they resolve after some time, then there's certainly time for them to explore um, and explore what the underlying condition is. So typically, I would advise all patients with any symptoms to consult a doctor. A doctor may do some simple tests as shown on this slide. They may do some simple blood tests, a tracing of the heart, or some simple running tests before they go for more sophisticated, perhaps non-invasive te tests to determine the underlying problem. Uh, given the scale of this issue, it's it's heartening to know that there are practical steps mapped out already to respond to them. Now, Dr. Chan, we've seen amazing innovations in the healthcare industry these past few years. Can you give us a clear picture on the latest advance uh, advancements in diagnosing heart conditions? Okay, sure. Uh, definitely, there's been uh, quite a lot of advancement in terms of technology. So I'll first focus on uh, imaging or scanning to assess uh, the most common uh, heart condition, which is uh, coronary artery disease. What that means is that arteries in the heart is blind blood flow to the heart is being blocked. Um, so in this area, uh, next, traditionally, we use coronary angiogram, which is an invasive method. So that involves actually putting in a, a, a catheter, a tube into the blood vessel, uh, usually through the artery, either in the arm or in the, in the, in the groin area. And then uh, with uh, injection of some uh, radiation, uh, some contrast material, we actually get to see uh, the diagram below. Uh, you get to see uh, whether the arteries are, are blocked or not. And then we can then uh, do intervention. So that's the most um, traditional way of doing things. But lately, the last couple of years, we have seen uh, really advances in the CT scan technologies. And uh, with that, uh, now with uh, reasonable and low radiation, with good um, quality machines, uh, we are able to actually have pretty good uh, high quality images for us to actually non-invasively without having to put a uh, tube into, into into the person to actually diagnose and look at the arteries of the heart to see how bad um, the blockage is next. And another aspect of coronary and, uh, artery disease and looking at um, this, this condition is actually a screening. So in people who have got um, um, some uh, risk factors and high risk, we, we usually would typically do a screening first and typically um, the past, we used to do a uh, stress um, exercise treadmill. I think a lot of us have heard that on that. Uh, further, we, we sometimes pair and match that with an echo to look at uh, blood circulation. And uh, sometimes we do use this technique using nuclear material uh, with an isotope to look at the blood circulation next. But again, with the advances now in the CT scan, uh, next please, uh, in uh, CT scan and MRI technology, we can actually now um, not just uh, because sometimes echo and ultrasound, the image quality is not so good. So now uh, we are using CT scan or even MRI uh, technique to actually look at um, how uh, how well the blood uh, is flowing in the heart muscle. So that gives us a sense of the risk uh, in the in the patient. So we are now having uh, more accuracy in terms of uh, looking at um, patients' risk profile. Next. 
And another aspect in terms of uh, imaging scanning of, um, of uh, our patients uh, is in the area of heart failure and structural heart disease. So traditionally, it would be uh, on the left, an echo uh, scan to look at the heart function, the structure of the heart. So besides the heart muscles and the heart pitch valves, um, and so that is the typical way. And now uh, we actually have uh, MRI uh, technique, which we can actually, uh, if you could see the diagram in the middle, we can actually now have better accuracy looking at the heart muscles, uh, looking at the valve. Uh, so that uh, diagram in the middle actually shows a huge tumor in one of the valves. So you can actually see it with very good accuracy uh, and good image quality. At the same time, there's uh, on the right side, cardiac PET scan. So this will uh, allow us to actually also uh, assess heart function uh, in, in, with uh, better accuracy as well. Thanks. And Dr. Chan, beyond these uh, fantastic advances in diagnosing and screening, uh, what advancements have we seen in the management of these conditions? So we come again, the management of? Of, 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 of patients with, let's say, heart failure conditions. Right. So heart failure um, has been uh, a worldwide um, a condi condition uh, that is uh, causing uh, quite a lot of issues in terms of uh, uh, rising healthcare expenditure uh, as well as uh, survival. So people with heart failure really, if you look at the, the, the graph on the right, has got uh, much um, impact um, survival compared to the general population. Next. So in terms of uh, heart failure, the main issue, uh, next, it, the, mix, the main issue with heart failure, actually, it's uh, hospitalization. So a lot of heart failure patients uh, in their stable state on and off actually gets admitted. So this is where the issue comes in. It impairs quality of life of the patient. And also, uh, that's the main piece that actually uh, cause issues, uh, rise uh, healthcare expenditure mix. And besides uh, hospitalization, um, there is an re in increased rate of re-hospitalization in this group patient mix. So um, in the last, um, for many years, we actually do not have a breakthrough in terms of heart failure medications. So we do have quite a few medications um, for heart failure already in terms of improving symptoms and survival, but we haven't had a breakthrough for many years. But thank goodness the last five to six years, we actually uh, have got these two medications. So 2014-15, we see um, the emergence of uh, Entresto. So this medicine has been shown to really improve uh, symptoms as well as the uh, hospitalization rate. It decreased hospitalization rate uh, significantly. Now the right, uh, this is the last uh, couple of years. We have seen the emergence of SGLT2 inhibitors. This medicine not just um, improve in terms of hospitalization rate and symptoms for your life, it has been shown to improve survival. And uh, the use of it now we know extends beyond uh, heart failure patients. Next, besides medication, uh, we are also looking at uh, uh, advances in the devices. Um, so for heart failure patients, a lot of time, especially in the advanced stage, uh, we can consider. Uh, there are four certain criteria. We can consider cardiac rate synchronization therapy. It's, it's actually um, a procedure where you insert, you can see uh, wires um, both in the left and right side of the heart to synchronize the heart and improve heart function. So this has been shown to improve survival of the heart failure patients. And then next um, recent uh, couple of years, we have, we have seen uh, the emergence of microclip procedure. And this procedure uh, is now in the guidelines has been shown to improve uh, symptoms and quality of life of a heart failure patient. And of course, in our, in our clinic, um, Dr. T is someone who is really an expert in this field. And uh, for people with advanced uh, heart failure, for advanced heart failure in the past, um, where patients reach the end of the, the treatment uh, 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 strategies, uh, we have uh, really nothing else to offer but heart transplant. But unfortunately, heart transplant, there's quite a lot of limitation because of the limited supply of the organs. Um, the last uh, decade, 10 years, we've seen a great improvement in terms of uh, ventricular assist device implantation. So on the left uh, here that you could see, uh, left down corner, uh, this is a ventricular assist device. So what that means is uh, it's a, it's a, it involves a surgery where you put in this pump. So this pump actually takes over the heart function. It draws uh, blood from the heart. It pumps back into the into the big artery for blood circulation. So in patients who are suitable for this procedure, this procedure has honestly shown uh, significant improvement in survival of this uh, end-stage uh, heart failure disease. So I'd like to circle back to some of the, the specific procedures in a bit, uh, but perhaps to nuance this conversation further, Dr. Chan, as the former co-director of the Women's Heart Health Service at NUHCS, 
uh, how does treating heart conditions among women differ, uh, differ from treating them among men? Uh, what risk factors and preventative measures should women specifically be aware of? Okay, uh, we will first talk about the treatment of uh, heart diseases uh, in women first. Um, actually, the most common uh, heart condition in women is still coronary artery disease, um, which is not different from men. But um, unfortunately, if you look at this slide here, we do see that uh, for many years, even till now, uh, women are getting uh, less well treated. Less, less uh, well treated in a way, they receive uh, even with the same same conditions like heart attack and all that. They tend to receive um, treatment with medications as well as balloon and stenting procedure to unblock the arteries. Uh, they much less done in women um, mixed, and therefore it results in a worse outcome. And from from studies now, we know um, actually a lot of this has it comes down to awareness among the the women as well as even physicians. So a lot of, um, uh, uh, so among the women and public as well as our, even our physicians, um, very few of us are aware, uh, especially in the family physicians, uh, that, that actually um, heart conditions are very common. In fact, it's the uh, top killer uh, of women. Um, and a lot of people mix, uh, actually focus uh, more on the other aspect of uh, health. Uh, mix, please. Yeah, so in, it has been, uh, in general, a focus uh, in women's health more on the reproductive system like the ovary uh, ovary and the uh, uterus issue the reproductive uh, organs uh, disease as well as a uh, breast condition like breast cancer and so leading to this quantum uh, begins approach uh, to, to women's health mix and at the same time there's under representation um, in women uh, of women in uh, treatment trials mix yeah so this actually leads to um therefore uh, the the, the, the um, uh, under under treating uh, women in that sense, but of course, apart from coronary artery disease, women do have got heart conditions that are, are specific, are more frequent or more specific in women. So, for example, uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So that's where the heart arteries, where this is the coronary arteries, the, heart, the arteries that supply the blood vessels that supply uh, blood into the heart. Um, so unlike the common ones that we have described previously, when you see cholesterol plaque formation and causing a blockage, what happens is that the two layers, the wall between in the wall of the blood vessels, actually uh, there, there's a tear and then there's a blood accumulation inside and that's, what, and that's why it causes a blockage. So this condition uh, is more common in women and uh, typically we see it during a pregnancy. So this is one of the conditions that is more specific to women and actually requires a bit of a, a tweak and a, a difference in terms of treatment approach um, to this condition. The other condition is Takatsubo. So this is actually a heart failure condition where the heart uh, gets weak suddenly, usually because of emotional stress or certain uh, acute stress condition. Again, it's more, more common in, in women and requires a different approach uh, to treating this heart failure. And um, for heart failure and pregnancy, heart failure pregnancy is uh, a condition that we only see in women and usually occurs in the third trimester towards the end, uh, just before delivery or um, in, in the first few weeks after delivery. So all these are, are conditions that is um, more common or specific to women and uh, definitely requires a different uh, approach uh, to management. Thanks. Yeah, so when we come to uh, risk factors, traditionally uh, risk factors for heart conditions include diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and uh, lifestyles uh, risk factors are actually very significant and often overlooked by most of us. So uh, if you don't exercise, uh, overweight, um, you smoke, so this all puts such a risk. So this is the conventional or traditional ones. But now we recognize that uh, actually there's emerging non-traditional cardiovascular risk factors that puts people at risk of heart condition. And if you look at the list on the right side, next. You look at the list on the right side and it's not hard to to, to understand it most of the uh, the the risk factors here are related with uh, women so if you in terms of pregnancy if you have got diabetes high blood pressure um, during pregnancy um, preterm delivery all this puts you at risk uh, of heart conditions subsequently so especially high blood pressure is one of the most common ones it puts you at risk of developing heart condition even many years um, after after pregnancy and then uh, for breast cancer, now we know that the medication used to treat breast cancer puts the, uh, the heart at risk. So people tend to develop heart failure um, from 
at risk of heart failure. And of course, that, that is specific to women. And other things, autoimmune disease, um, depression, they are, they are more common in women as well. Next. So um, what can we do in terms of preventive measures um, uh, to, to improve the outcome in terms of heart disease for women? So first, I think, uh, like I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, is, the, is the awareness. We, we first need to improve awareness among the women. Uh, and as well as physicians, so we recognize that women are at risk, get them to screen early, regularly for uh, the risk factors that were mentioned. Uh, in terms of lifestyle, uh, dietary, um, exercise, and uh, we now know stress play a major part as well. So we could do some lifestyle modification that they expect. And um, we screen them early and once we diagnose any risk factors that we mentioned, especially um, diabetes, hypertension, we manage them well, make sure that they reach the optimal target. And of course, if there are symptoms that arise, uh, we need to encourage the women to seek um, evaluation and treatment early. So health promotion, that is education, continues to be a vital step, right? So de debunking these long-held beliefs that cardiovascular health is really just a concern for men. Um, Dr. Chan, maybe just uh, last question, follow-up question. Um, more concretely, what options do institutions like Mount Elizabeth Hospital extend to women managing heart conditions? Right. So um, Mount Elizabeth uh, Hospital actually has uh, recognized I mean, the fact that um, women has their conditions in terms of heart disease that's specific to women. And they have actually put in um, a lot of effort um, to do uh, health promotion as well as exploring improving diagnostic options to, to try and uh, diagnose and treat this uh, the, the, the specific condition as well as possible. At the same time, we have a huge group of uh, um, a specialists here, including because there's, uh, it's important we, we partner uh, the obstetrician and gynae, and uh, we, we do have got close relationship between the doctors where we can help to manage this problem. Thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Moving to another pressing topic, um, mm -hmm. we see a large number of patients with coronary artery disease experiencing chronic total occlusion. Uh, Dr. Chia, can you please explain what to uh, chronic total occlusion is? Uh, how it develops, how it affects the heart and the body? Right. So, no, certainly. Again, chronic total occlusion yeah. refers to coronary artery disease. It's a certain spectrum. Now, again, to understand chronic total occlusion, we have to understand what is coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis. So as you can see as, as a slide here, on the left panel, that is a normal artery. But over time, the blood vessels in our heart, we may develop deposits of cholesterol, inflammatory cells, and gradually over time, we are talking about months and years, this may progress until it finally blocks up the artery and then it restricts the blood flow to the heart. Perhaps I can show you a model here, if you can see here. So this, I can, as you can see, is a normal artery where you have a clear lumen where blood can flow through. But with time, you may have this small yellow deposits around here and that progressively gets worse and worse. And again, until one day, it may cause a very severe narrowing. So this is perhaps an 89% narrowing. But however, sometimes this can progress to 100% complete blockage. And when that happens, that is called a chronic total occlusion. Of course, if a blood vessel becomes completely blocked suddenly in the person, you will get a heart attack. You get severe chest pain and you have to rush to a hospital. But sometimes this can be a gradual process. So the, as the blood vessels become completely blocked, you develop small arteries around it to supply the muscle so that the person doesn't get a sudden heart attack. Now I'll show you on the next slide. This is a typical, angi typical angiogram where on the left panel, rather than a straight path down the artery, where the arrow shows us multiple areas of blockage. It's like rope blocks, so blood can flow through nicely. Again, on the right panel, this is a blood vessel on the right where the arrows will show that right at the beginning, at the middle part of the artery, it's completely blocked. So blood cannot flow through the artery. And in these kind of patients, they may experience chest discomfort, angina, shortness of breath, or even heart failure. So when this happens, the patients may present very similarly to those with coronary artery disease, where they may feel tired, breathless, with exertion, and they may really feel that their lifestyle is limited. Dr. Chia, what are the diagnostic procedures when it comes to chronic total occlusion? Uh, what tips a cardiologist like yourself off to these cases? Yes, again, certainly I think if a patient has symptoms, 
if they go through some of the non-invasive tests like stress tests, it will certainly make, it, make us suspicious of underlying severe disease. But then, again, to clinch a diagnosis, it will be down to a CT scan followed by an angiogram as we showed before. And chronic total occlusion is estimated to occur in about one in 10 patients with underlying coronary artery disease. Now, the main challenge for these patients is that how do we deal with the problem? So let's say if a blockage is 70%, we typically, it's quite easy for us to you know, unblock them, put a balloon, put a stent, unblock the artery. But in the past, chronic total occlusions are difficult, mainly because we can't cross the blockage. It's like a brick wall where you are stuck and we can't treat the patients. And very often, their only option is to either live with the symptoms or go for open heart surgery, a bypass. But now, we'll show you the next slide. With better technique and better devices, we actually have very good options for our patients. So for example, the, um, the artery that I showed you before on the left side, where there are multiple roadblocks in the artery. Now through very specialized techniques uh, um, with highly skilled um, operators and devices, you can see that we have cleared the path. So the artery is restored and these patients' symptoms was completely re uh, resolved. And again, on the next slide, again, where the blood vessel was completely blocked in the mid segment. Again, these are the patients that will typically send to our, sur uh, our surgical colleagues for an open heart surgery. But as the patient refused, and actually through a special technique where we not just try to open the artery from the front end, we also go from the back end, what we call a retrograde technique, a you know, highly specialized technique, that finally we can actually restore the blood flow completely on the right panel, as you can see, now it's a nice big large artery so that blood can flow through nicely, the, the heart function improves, the symptoms are resolved, and the patient is very happy because he didn't have to go for a big surgery to, rest, to restore his um, normal activity. Amazing. Um, Dr. Jia, what about uh, intravascular lithotripsy? I understand this is a relatively new treatment on the market. Uh, how does this work to treat coronary artery disease? Yes, certainly intravascular lithotripsy is quite a, a very interesting tool that we have had in the last couple of years. Now, lithotripsy, the idea is basically your litho is like stone, you're blasting stones. And this is a typical technique you use to blast kidney stones for patients with, who, are, who are suffering from kidney stones. You know, some doctors will offer you some ultrasound kind of uh, blasting of the stones to blast, blast, to break up the stone. And this is actually the same concept. As you can see here, sometimes our arteries have calcium deposits that are hardened, just like kidney stones. So this is a device where we have a balloon that we pass across into the artery. Then it emits an electrical signal. It vaporizes the saline or the fluid that's within the body or within the balloon. And when this happens, this is transmitted into sonic pressure waves that goes into artery to break up the hardened calcium in the artery. Now, again, to understand why this is useful, I'll show you the next slide. So what do we do with blockages in the heart? Do these balloons and deposits? Usually, the typical treatment, we use a balloon, stretch open this blockage, open up the lumen, and thereafter, we place a stent, which is like a wire mesh, on the right panel that you can see we insert in the artery to unblock the artery so that blood can flow through nicely. And on the next, pan, uh, on the next slide, you'll see a live case where on the right side, on the left panel, you have a tight blockage as shown by the arrow. But we can easily balloon it and then we put a stand and you can show on the other panel and you see blood flow is restored. But this is only possible if the balloon can stretch open the artery. Sometimes the plugs that are in the heart, they are very hard. They are calcified like brick walls and you simply have no way to unblock them. So this is where IVL, the intervascular restricted seat, allowed the, the doctor to do his, his job. On the next panel, on the next slide, you can see, this is a patient that came to me with a tight blockage, about 70%, and we use a balloon at high pressure and we simply cannot unblock it because it's so hard. So again, a couple of years ago, we may either have to consider more invasive strategies or bypass surgery for this patient. And on the second um, panel there on number two, you can see that we try to use a balloon, but there's kind of a dog bone effect. In other words, the balloon can't stretch the artery. But then we deploy the IVL. So this device, it delivered some pulse waves into artery and it nicely cracked the calcium. And once that is done, 
the doctor can easily just slip in the stand, open up the artery, and then restore the blood flow and improve the symptoms for our patient. Again, this is a huge advancement in, in, in technology that allows us to treat our patients more safely and effectively. So taking inspiration from other medical field, uh, medical fields and bringing it into the cardiovascular, that's amazing. Uh, but Dr. Chi, aside from IVL, could you share some other recent developments in the diagnosis, treatment, and management of these uh, diseases? Yeah. I think certainly, I think doctors together with scientists and engineers, we are constantly collaborating and coming up with ideas. So there are always a lot of devices. I think there's too numerous to explain that to allow the doctors to do their job. So again, some of the treatment, for example, we have the angiojet thrombectomy system, which has been refined over a couple of years. And together with other uh, companies, as well as the number of devices, essentially it's like a vacuum cleaner in the artery. So essentially you put a catheter in there and you can suck out the blood clot for patients who are having heart attacks. Sometimes there are patients at very high risk where they have heart failure and even to try to do a procedure on them is too unsafe. So nowadays we can actually put a device like what we call an impeller device. It's like a pump inside the heart, in a, actually through the blood vessel without, a, without open heart surgery, just to support the heart function. And there are also other devices such as the one called Stingray that allows us to poke through the artery to allow us to unblock chronic total occlusion or the diamond bag, which is another device which allows us to shave off the hardened calcium in the artery, all, all with the objective to allow us to unblock the artery to restore the blood flow so that the patient can have a much better quality of life. Now, Dr. Tay, uh, speaking of medical devices, uh, I'd like to direct these next few questions to you as they fall right in your wheelhouse. Uh, could you tell us about transcatheter valve intervention, specifically uh, transcatheter aortic valve implantation, I think it's a TAVI, uh, and mitral valve repair? Why are these procedures done, and which types of patients benefit most from these interventions? Right. In the past uh, 10 years, I think there's a big move towards uh, therapies that are less invasive, and that's the key driver for some of these new technologies. So this is a picture of a patient with a heart valve condition called aortic stenosis. So essentially stenosis means that the valves are hardened and they are unable to open well. So that means the heart, as it tries to pump, these valves can actually obstruct the flow of blood out of the heart. Uh, in the past, the patients had only one option, and that was to open the chest, uh, remove the obstruction, and then sew in a new valve. Uh, but over the last uh, decade, uh, especially in the last five years, there's a big move towards this technique called TAVI, or transcatheter aortic valve implantation. So what this technology does is essentially mix what we do for coronary artery blockages. So we actually put in a device that looks like a balloon uh, that we use. And this the balloon first goes into the valve, uh, dilates and cracks open the, the valve. But we can't just dilate it with a balloon alone. Like the coronary arteries, we need to put in this metal or stent to hold up the the, uh, the, the the obstruction so it doesn't come back again. And also there are now valves sewn within the inside of these stents, which then start to work immediately. So in the video you see on the right, this is a situation where a tabby valve is being uh, deployed and that opens up a channel for the heart to pump blood out much more easily. And this actually improves patients' symptoms. As you know, aortic stenosis, patients develop symptoms of chest pain or breathlessness. And once we open up this blockage, again, the patient's symptoms would be improved. So if we go on to the next slide, um, that again uh, looks at a different uh, problem. This is a patient with a mitral valve disease. Again, mitral valve is another valve inside the heart. And until only five to 10 years ago, there was no other option to treat these patients with a leaky heart valve. So these valves, when they close, they don't close tight enough. So there's a jet of blood that goes backwards and sort of all going forward. So that makes the heart uh, strained. And patients who have these symptoms, uh, have this condition can develop uh, shortness of breath, chest discomfort, or even heart failure. And again, uh, by mimicking what the surgeons can do, uh, the interventional uh, engineers and the doctors have kind of devised a technique where we can put in a little device called a clip. And this clip actually goes into the heart from the veins of the thigh. And that allows us to, to direct a tiny clip to try to grasp uh, the two leaflets of this valve to make it tighter and to enhance its ability to close well. And again, with uh, uh, this therapy, 
it has made life a lot easier for the patients because the patients don't have to have their chest uh, cracked open and typically they can go home uh, much earlier after the procedure. So maybe we can move on to the... Yeah, so uh, okay. I mean, yeah. These, these sound like pretty profound advancements, Dr. Tay. Uh, how has the development of these technologies improved procedures and interventional cardiology as a whole? So as you know, these uh, technologies, like what uh, Stanley mentioned earlier in, uh, in cardiovascular space, there isn't a, a day where engineers have stopped thinking. It's always thinking about what's, what's tomorrow, what's better. And um, just last week, we have another update in the um, uh, tabby valves where a new uh, skirt was put around the valve to make the valve a little bit more efficient, uh, prevents uh, problems of leaking and actually enhances the outcomes of these patients. And similarly, the new uh, iteration of the mitral valve clip uh, is coming to Singapore in a couple of weeks. And this allows us to uh, actually treat a lot more patients with uh, different pathologies. So a lot of exciting things coming along the way uh, because we have uh, the engineers continuously innovate uh, and think about the future. So what can patients who undergo these procedures expect after undergoing uh, TAVI or mitral valve repair? Okay, so we mentioned a little bit about uh, what happens after the procedure. Remember, we do these procedures for two main uh, reasons. The first is to prolong life. So if you can see from the slides here, for both TAVI as well as mitral clip, they actually extend lives. So patients with these conditions, if they are left untreated, the prognosis is quite uh, dismal in the sense uh, patients get heart failure and, and the lifespan is actually shortened. So with these technologies, you can see significant improvements or extensions of longevity uh, in the suitable uh, patient cohort. So that's the first reason to uh, prolong lives. The second reason you will see in the next slide is really to improve patients' quality of life. And this is uh, critical, especially in patients who are suffering sometimes even months to years of uh, heart failure or breathlessness. And you can see the, the, the point of improvement actually starts off very early, two weeks to a month after the procedure. Patients already start feeling quite uh, well. And in this chart, we call it a uh, quality of life score. It remarkably increases significantly over two weeks. And it's not just the physical improvement of the patients, there's also emotional benefits and social benefits of this therapy. So it actually, in, in, a, in a complete sense, actually makes the patients uh, not just feel better, but actually allow them to have much better quality. Of the patients at Mount Elizabeth Hospital who've undergone these procedures, what was their experience like? How have their lives improved after these interventions? Yeah, so um, when you uh, treat these patients with uh, the right uh, therapies you, and you direct the treatment to the right problems, the patient's symptoms are obviously improved. So patients who have, say, prior chest discomfort or dyspnea or breathlessness or inability to exercise, they would experience a significant improvement and therefore uh, lives are often changed. Even the carers themselves will have a big relief because they used to care a lot for these patients who are oftentimes uh, have a lot of uh, symptoms and the carers themselves are of, of, uh, obviously benefiting also from the fact that they see the, the joy in, in, in their relatives and, 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 and that really helps them as well. So finally, I would like to say that um, in Mount Elizabeth Hospital, the uh, uh, what has improved is really the uh, ins installation of this uh, thing called the hybrid operating theater. This is really a um, ability for us to do these technology, uh, to use these therapies in a very clean and sterile environment because these valves that we implant in patients' hearts, we don't want to get bacteria on them. So this is done in a specialized room. We call it a hybrid operating room. So it has the ability to do surgery as well as to do these procedures. But what's most important is not just the hardware, obviously, uh, it's really the software in the heart of the hospital, which is really the people. And many of these technologies, while they are great, uh, really requires a whole team to do after the patient get good results. So thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Tay. Um, I have a couple questions from the audience that I'd like to throw your way. Um, these first few on the topic of heart disease. Uh, so this first one's for Dr. Chan. Um, one of our participants asks, I have congestive heart failure and aortic valve regur regurgitation. What should I do to strengthen my heart? For context, I had chemo, ACT, and Herceptin for breast cancer 14 years ago. Now, Dr. Chan, I think your, your, your mic is on mute. There's a few risk, sorry, there's a few risk factors in this uh, scenario that we, we, we first got to pick up. Um, so uh, first of all, 
uh, the patient has got uh, breast cancer um, uh, the 14 years ago. So sometimes, the, depending on what kind of uh, medication uh, is being used, uh, some of these medications can uh, it, it results in heart failure even years down the road. That's one thing. Uh, second thing, the aortic regurgitation. What aortic regurgitation means is that one of this uh, leaflet, this valve that uh, controls direction of blood flow in this uh, outflow tract of the of the heart. Um, so the leaflets, we have to first assess um, whether there's structurally anything wrong uh, with the with the leaflets. Uh, so what happens in aortic regurgitation is that the blood flows through and then keeps coming backwards and and therefore causes heart failure. So if there's something structurally wrong with this uh this this uh, valve leaflets then uh, there may need to be procedure or even surgery. So there's a few things that puts the heart at risk uh, of this particular patient. So first, got to assess um, this, this in these few angles first. And of course, the main approach in general, um, so for people with uh, heart failure and um, if it's chemotherapy related, so there are medications, uh, just like what we have shown previously for in terms of advancement and heart failure medications, improve symptoms, improve uh, long-term outcome, and um, uh, of the of the patient, and in terms of uh, aortic valve, I mentioned that if, if there's a need really structurally wrong, something wrong with the valves, then we do need to consider uh, procedure surgery to repair the the, the aortic valves or even uh, do uh, uh, replacement. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Doctor Tay. This is a question from a participant who seems to be concerned about multiple concurrent conditions. Uh, they ask. Are these three conditions dangerous in one person? Uh, bicuspid aortic valve, uh, MVP, that is mitral valve prolapse, and pulmonary hypertension. Right, so these actually are three separate uh, conditions. So I'll just briefly explain what these are. So bicuspid aortic valve is actually a congenital heart valve disease. Most of us uh, in the aortic valve have three leaflets. Uh, patients with bicuspid aortic valve have two leaflets. And in this particular condition, uh, it happens one in about 100 patients. And what we see is that although the majority of patients are still okay with this valve, a small proportion of patients, as they get older, they may develop either valve leaking or valve stenosis or the valve doesn't open well. Uh, so if the patient is um, doing well, has no symptoms, and on examination by the doctor, there isn't, isn't a heart murmur, then typically the patients can be followed up and uh, observed. But if they have a heart murmur or they're not feeling well, then certainly uh, they need to, to look uh, for a, a doctor to evaluate this a little further. The second uh, condition is mitral valve prolapse. And this is again a kind of uh, condition where the valve leaflets themselves are a little bit soft. And when they close, they actually bend a little bit. Um, again, occurs about one, in, one, one to 5% uh, of uh, patients. Uh, and what happens is that most patients uh, are fine, but a small group of patients may develop leaking of these valves. And uh, when they leak, they generate a sound which uh, the family doctor often picks up, or they can actually develop even uh, uh, heart failure or breathlessness if they are not uh, treated and if the valve leaks uh, significantly. And thirdly, pulmonary hypertension is really a condition where the lung pressures of the uh, lung pressures actually rise, and this is oftentimes. Uh, related to sometimes heart valve disease or left heart disease. So if you look at these conditions in isolation, they, they could be, uh, it, it could not, maybe it didn't cause much problems to the patients, but these uh, conditions actually can, can be uh, a problem in some patients. Uh, and uh, when, when, they when they surface, uh, patients again, oftentimes will, will complain of symptoms of uh, shortness of breath uh, or chest discomfort. And certainly, they need, they need to be evaluated uh, by their doctors or their cardiologists. Uh, Dr. Chi, we actually have a couple questions coming in from the audience for you. Uh, right. First one is, uh, how can my high blood pressure be controlled? It's currently in the 140s, over 80. I developed this problem after I had COVID-19. What are the top three things a hypertensive can do to improve this condition? Right. Now, for high blood pressure or hypertension, again, this is a common problem. Now, firstly, we always advise lifestyle changes. Again, in terms of lifestyle, exercise, weight loss, and a low salt diet. So again, even before we consider further therapy, look at the patient in general. Is the patient overweight? Is he sleeping well enough? Is he very stressed? Again, see if there's any adjustment to lifestyle that can be achieved to lower the blood pressure. Again, if the blood pressure is still high in spite of all these uh, measures, and of course, medication is definitely indicated. 
So the key to the importance of medication is that we want to maintain that lower blood pressure. And we now recognize that if you have a blood pressure lower, let's say less than 130, less than 80 uh, when you're at rest, then your long-term risk of heart failure and stroke, as well as heart disease, will be significantly lower. So I think do discuss with your doctor what kind of medication may best suit you because there are different kinds of blood pressure medication that will be applicable to patients from different age groups and with different other risk factors. Now, as for the issue of COVID, yet yeah, COVID vaccination, well, it's true it has been recognized that immediately after COVID vaccination, in some patients, they do um, develop slightly higher blood pressure. But again, this will gradually settle in the course of a few weeks and months and back to a baseline. The more important question that we have to ask is, is the patient already having base, um, borderline high blood pressure beforehand? If the blood pressure was high beforehand and then it gets um, exa uh, exaggerated after vaccination, we will still have to address the high blood pressure issue right before uh, vaccination. So again, do keep a good blood pressure diary and if it's persistently high, do this, um, adopt good lifestyle measures and discuss with your doctor on what medication will be suitable for you. So speaking of lifestyle changes, on the topic of nutrition, uh, yes. this next question goes, what can, be, what can be the substitute for nutrients that you would normally get from various fruits and vegetables if one cannot eat those fibrous fruits and vegetables? Okay, now, I think first of all, you have to ask, why can't the person eat the fibrous fruit and vegetables? Of course, sometimes very fibrous fruit can cause a lot of gastric um, disturbances and digestion. So of course, in that case, I would suggest you just discuss with your dietitian are there other substitutes, things that are less fibrous that may be more suited for you? However, if for patients who, for example, have difficulty swallowing or they have, an, um, they have a nasogastric tube where swallowing, uh, basically eating food is not possible, then usually all the nutrient, most of the nutrients can be found in many, uh, many of the uh, multivitamins or other commercially available uh, supplements that are available in the market. So I would suggest discuss with your doctor or dietitian, first of all, what is the underlying problem preventing you from eating vegetables and fruits? And if you can eat them, maybe change, make adjustment. Different kinds of vegetables or less fibrous vegetables may be good. But otherwise, certainly uh, we can have other kinds of supplements that can be ingested either in liquid form or in tablets. This next question is for Dr. Chan. Um, Question asker uh, goes, I am a heart bypass patient. My procedure was done back in 2017. What kind of diagnostic test, perhaps like an MRI, should be done five years after a bypass? Okay, uh, usually a um, couple of years after bypass. Okay, most of the time, really, we, we go according to symptoms. So if the patient um, is having symptoms or not having symptoms, I mean, if the patient doesn't have any symptoms, he's been quite well, uh, then typically, actually, we, we don't really need an MRI scan, uh, something uh, that, that intends to, to, to check. So usually it would be a screening. So we could actually use uh, ECHO, which is an ultrasound-based method, simple, uh, that doesn't have uh, too much of um, side effects, it's just an ultrasound, to look at the heart function, make sure that um, the heart is still functioning well. And uh, depending, sometimes if uh, there is risk profile factors, like uh, there's uncontrolled blood pressure or diabetes patients are at higher risk of getting issues again, then we may do some screening um, approach. And the screening approach, uh, most of the time, can be just a simple stress test. Uh, so MRI comes in, I think, uh, really in patients with symptoms. So of course, if you have got um, a bypass and five years down the road, there are some symptoms, um, we would need to do further evaluation. The first uh, approach in, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, situation actually would be more a CT scan. So a CT scan now, I mentioned earlier on, um, acceptable radiation dose, uh, the good quality, will actually allow us to assess uh, the arteries of the heart and the bypass, um, the bypass uh, vessels uh, conditions, whether there, is, uh, there are any uh, blockage that, that is building up. Uh, MRI comes in, uh, yes, it does. Uh, if uh, we do find significant issue on the CT scan and there is a question on um, whether uh, the heart function, uh, the fact that there is an issue with heart function, whether the heart muscle, because a lot of patients with uh, artery blockage before, uh, there can be injury on the muscles and the scar tissue. Uh, that's when MRI comes in to help us plan uh, the next uh, treatment strategy. Fantastic. 
Um, this question is for Dr. Chia. Um, has intravascular lithotripsy been done in the Philippines or perhaps in the region? And how successful is this procedure? Yeah. Again, um, I'm not familiar with uh, what has been done in the Philippines hospital, but I know certainly around Asia, um, lithotripsy has been, IBR has been used quite widely. And it's generally a very successful tool. Now, just to understand what is used for in the past to break up all these calcium, we actually have variety of devices such as what we call rotation drills or other more let's say higher risk devices to try to res resolve the calcium calcium issue little the, this IBL is basically a very simple tool that can be easily used by most cardiologists all it involves is just placing a balloon there press on a button and then it starts delivering the pulse because of the simplicity and relatively low um, risk it is widely adopted certainly um, it's down to availability in the local hospital. It's easy to use and it's very effective, which is just a matter of how many pulses, then how many electrical pulses are needed. And once you crack the calcium, basically the treatment is just like any other um, balloon and scenting procedure. It simplifies it a lot and it makes it so much safer for all our patients. That really is amazing. Uh, so we still have time for each of our speakers to share their quick closing thoughts, but we are nearing the end of today's session. Uh, as we won't be able to address all the questions still coming in from our audience, our organizing team is making sure to note them all down so our speakers can reach out after today's event to share their insights. So that said, um, to those participants online, please feel free to keep sending in those questions and comments. Now, to formally close our session, I'd like to invite each of our panelists to share their closing thoughts. Perhaps we can start with Dr. Chan. Uh, we've spoken a lot today about all the new ways we can manage and prevent cardiovascular disease. Perhaps you can share a bit about how Mount Elizabeth is equipped to diagnose and treat this disease. Right. So I think uh, with regards to um, diagnosing and uh, imaging approach and scans, uh, the hospitals uh, has really been um, uh, taking and putting in a lot of effort uh, in acquiring uh, state-of-the-art uh, imaging techniques like CT scan, MRI, that enables us cardiologists practicing here to uh, be able to use and image patient uh, to diagnose and and therefore treat um, conditions accurately. Uh, when it comes to advanced heart failure, actually, uh, there are many specialists in, in this hospital as well that we work closely with because, of course, heart failure uh, is a condition that a lot of time needs a lot of collaboration. So, uh, like the devices that we mentioned earlier on, uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, mitral clips, I think in our group, uh, Dr. Jeremy Chow, who is an electrophysiologist, and uh, Dr. Tay uh, are very well equipped and expert in this field. Uh, for ventricular assist device, uh, we work closely with our surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeons here, who are, are experts in, their, in, in this field as well. And we are able to work as a team to, to provide um, the, the latest and uh, best treatment strategy for our heart failure patients. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Uh, Dr. Chia? Yes. Now, I think certainly, I think here in Singapore, here in mind, Elizabeth, I think of all, we, we are all confident of our technical expertise, our, um, our services, our devices, the procedure. But more importantly, now we, are, we would like to focus is on the patient. We are confident that we can provide patients with a more holistic uh, experience because I believe that it's not just the technical expertise that we all have, but it's the mental, social, emotional well-being of the patient that we can focus on, that together we can get on this journey of health. Thank you Thank for you. that. Thank you very much. Uh, and Dr. Tay, you have the last word of the session. Yeah, so I think, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. And uh, I think the most important thing is actually uh, just to reach out to patients, uh, educating uh, everyone that uh, it is important to be uh, careful with uh, our lifestyle, Caref uh, be aware of symptoms, uh, not to uh, push back and assume it's, uh, uh, it's uh, harmless. These symptoms of shortness of breath and chest pain may be something like a warning sign and usually that should be uh, evaluated. I think uh, uh, identifying disease early and uh, treating them early uh, it remains the most important uh, tool as you know prevention is so much uh, better than cure. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all again for, uh, for joining us uh, this time. I think that's a fantastic reminder to end today's session with. So thank you again, Dr. Chan Wansian, Dr. Stanley Chia, and Dr. Edgar Tay. Such a pleasure having you on today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you as well to our partners, Asian Heart and Vascular Center, 
Bank Marketing Association of the Philippines, the British Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, the European Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, the Management Association of the Philippines, the Metropolitan Davao Medical Society, the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, the Philippine Franchise Association, and the Pharmaceutical and Healthcare Association of the Philippines. A huge thank you to the Freeman and the Philippine Star, our media partners, to Mount Elizabeth and Business World, of course, for having me on today's wonderful session. And of course, to our audience, uh, please follow Mount Elizabeth's Facebook page for more information on how to treat or better prevent cardiovascular diseases. For inquiries, you can contact the Manila office of Parkway Hospital Singapore uh, that's located at the ground floor of Marco Polo Hotel in Ortiga Center, Pasig City. Uh, and can all, you can also reach them by email at manila.ph at parkwaypantai.com. That is parkwaypantai.com or via mobile at 0917-526-7576. And check out Business World social media pages for updates on more events like today's. Again, to everyone watching, wherever in the world you're tuning in from, my name is Tiago Arnaiz. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much. And we'll see you in the next session of Business World Insights. Stay safe. Stay healthy.